This uh, predominantly used Siddhar Sangara classification model of compounds has been criticized a lot by scholars like uh, M. W. Subhithupal Yudhisthira and Professor J. P. Sanayaka. Professor Sanayaka particularly is very critical of the compounds or the classification model of compounds proposed in Siddhar Sangara. I have quoted here a criticism from uh, uh, Professor J. P. Steve where he even challenges the existence of uh, certain uh, compound types. So, without going into a lot of detail, uh, let me uh, outline my research problem. So, the problem is, I believe very clear, that uh, the existing uh, classification system or the classification model for compound words or compound nouns specifically in the single language is inadequate and it's being criticized. Therefore, I'm trying to propose a more comprehensive classification model for the compound nouns, encompassing orthographic, phonological, morphological, typological, semantic and semantic chronological and historical dimensions of compounds. So all these aspects have not been taken into account in any of the previous classifications that have been proposed. So my research methodology is this, I have uh, uh, adopted a desk research approach in conducting this study, which means I rely a lot on secondary data and literary sources. So I have drawn uh, data as well as details about previous classifications from a variety of uh, secondary sources and primary sources like Siddhar Sangara. So I have analyzed these data using the methods and techniques in structural linguistics and uh, when it comes to making judgments and taking decisions, I have relied entirely on my discretion as a native speaker of Sinhala. So this involves kind of an insider perspective. So this is kind of open to debate and uh, discussion. So these are my findings which I really, really want to present to you. So all compounds in Sinhala can be classified into, two, into three main orthographic categories. This is a classification uh, which is applicable to a lot of other languages. So we have open compounds, or which we call spaced compounds, and closed compounds, and hyphenated compounds. So this classification itself challenges a very predominant uh, preconception about uh, compounds, which says that uh, compounds should always be written together without spaces in between, which is not the truth, which is not really true. It might be true for the Sanskrit language where uh, spacing is not a grammar rule or even a punctuation practice, but when it comes to modern languages, including Sinhala, compounds can be written in three different ways. You can put a space in between the two flexings of a compound and write, or else you can write the compound together, or else you can hyphenate the two compounds, but uh, uh, you can uh, you know, hyphenate the two flexings. But that is done only in relation to coordinating or copulative compounds in traditional grammar. We call them Dakar or the Samaja, or the other Samaja. Only such compounds can be written with a hyphen in between. Other compounds need to be either closed or open, which means you can write them with a space in between or without. Uh, more established compounds or the older compounds of a language usually are written without a space in between. They tend to be solid or closed compounds. Now if you take uh, uh, words like Kiribat, which have been in the language for several centuries, they are written together, nobody writes them separately. So, they are solid compounds. So we can assume that a lot of solid compounds or closed compounds tend to be very old ones. And now we have a morphostructural classification here. So this is the second approach to compounds in my classification model. So here I have taken into consideration the word classes of the who lexemes involved in the compounds. So it can be an adjective and a noun, it can be two nouns, it can be a participle and a noun. A participle is a form of a noun derived uh, from a verb and it can be a noun and a participle, it can be a gerund and a noun, it can be a noun and a gerund, it can be a particle and a noun.
So these are the seven different morphological structures that I have recognized in single components. But there can be more than these, but these are the only ones that I could recognize. You can add if you, uh, you know, know more than this. And then we have a semantic classification. This is of course a very age-old classification that we find in uh, even in Sanskrit grammar. Compounds can be broadly categorized into as endocentric and exocentric compounds. Endocentric compounds, you know, always have their head, semantic head, uh, or the referent inside the compound, which means like if you take a word like Holman, for example, it is a type of a mallet, it's a type of a flowers, type of flowers. But if you take a word like Helmut, it doesn't essentially refer to a type of a flower, it, it, it is something else, right? It's a nuisance or, a, or something useless, right? So in such cases, we have uh, exocentric compounds, which are also called the Hubridi Samasa in uh, Sanskrit grammar. Then also we have the dichotomy as deverbal and denominal compounds. So as the names themselves do suggest, deverbal compounds have a noun derived from a verb as the head, whereas denominal compounds have a noun as the head. Obviously the other element is also a noun. Then we have elliptical and non-elliptical compounds. So in elliptical compounds, case suffixes in the first lexeme have been elided, they have been omitted. But in non-elliptical compounds, uh, case suffixes in the first element or the first lexeme have been re retained. So non-elliptical compounds are mostly found in colloquial speech, but that doesn't mean that they are restricted to, uh, to the colloquial speech, they are found in classical language as well. Now, if you take a word like atavasi, for example, uh, the case suffix a in ate is retained there. So, this is another classification in which we can classify compound nouns. Then again, we have conjoined and disjoint compounds. So, conjoined compounds are the ones that involve a uh, uh, euphonic combination process in the lexeme boundary between the two lexemes. In the boundary between the two lexemes. Now, for example, if you take a uh, compound like Milupuri, which means blue lotus, and pool can be written separately without conjoining. Also, if you want, you can, you know, uh, apply a euphonic combination process, which means the Sandhi process, and con con conjoin them as Milupuri. So, both in both ways, certain compounds can be written. So, there's a dichotomy as conjoined as conjoined and disjoint compounds. But if you break a conjoint compound and you know write it separately in, in two parts, that's going to be wrong. For example, if you take lip gala, you can't write lip space gala, which is wrong. It should be lip gala if you want to disjoint them and write. And then we have a typological classification, which I believe is the most important part of my findings. So uh, all compounds in singular can be categorized into two as determinative compounds and copulative compounds. So determinative compounds are the compounds that have some kind of a modifier as the first element and the second element is obviously enough. So depending on what the first element is, they can be categorized further into attributive compounds and um, subordinative or case compounds. So attributive compounds are the ones that necessarily have an adjective as the first element. So here the adjective, I want to say, uh, has a relationship of a uh, uh, subject and a complement in the in, in a sentence. For example, if you take uh, Usam Misa, here the underlying the structure sentence is Misa Usam, which is a sentence containing a B verb. So in all attributive compounds, the underlying deep structure sentence is a B verb sentence that has a subject and the complement. So subject is essentially the head word of the compound, or else to put it differently, the head word of the compound comes from the subject, whereas the uh, determinant or the modifier 
comes from the complement. And then we have subordinate compounds. So in subordinate compounds, the underlying leaf structure sentence is not the B verb sentence. It doesn't have a B verb. Instead, it has a lexical verb. And the relationship between the two elements of the compound is also different from uh, that of a subject uh, and a complement. Here, what you have is a noun with another noun. And the relationship between them is mostly uh, uh, in grammatical cases, right? So these are the uh, these are the compounds that are traditionally called bhakti samasam. So I have listed down some examples, and I don't want to go into detail to save time. And then we have particle compounds. These are called avyaj bhakti samas or avyaj samas in traditional grammar. These are very little in singular. We don't have a lot of them because uh, in traditional grammars. Prefixal forms or nouns containing prefixes have been categorized as avyohi uh, samasa or avyasamasa, which is wrong, at least in reference to the singular language. That can be true for Sanskrit. So, uh, in singular, we have these particle compounds in which we have a particle or an impartha as the first element of the compound, and the second element is essentially a noun. Then we have copulative compounds, these are the ones that we call Dvanda Samasa or Takarasa Samasa in traditional grammar. A copulative compound can have two elements or even more, as you see in the examples on Spain. And then we have duplex compounds, which is an interesting thing because uh, duplex compounds are traditionally called Yugalapada and they have not been studied under compound words, but I believe that they can studied under compound words because they share a lot of features that compound words have and duplex words can also be regarded as a subcategory of copulative compounds or prakara samasa and uh, all duplex words can be broadly divided into two uh, classes or, or, or in, in two approaches they can be studied in a semantic approach and a phonemic approach so if you approach them semantically you can see sometimes duplex words contain two synonyms or two antonyms or two collocative words and if you approach them phonemically you will see that they have rhyming words and duplicative words and sometimes there are two onomatopoeic words put together and then we have an etymological classification where compounds can be classified etymologically as classical compounds, neoclassical compounds, colloquial compounds and hybrid compounds so classical compounds are the ones that you basically find in classical texts they are you know, adopted ones are basically from Pali and Sanskrit, whereas adapted forms, which means the Tadbal forms, are found in the Sinhalese words. So, neoclassical compounds are the ones that were coined uh, particularly during the utilization process of the Sinhal language in the early 19th and 20th centuries. And then, colloquial compounds, as you know, are from the colloquial language, the everyday spoken language. And then we have hybrid compounds. These are very interesting because traditional grammarians do not acknowledge the category as hybrid, hybrid compounds and they even say that they are wrong and should be corrected. But we need to admit the fact that there are hybrid compounds in any language of which one element is from one language and the other element is from another. Then another interesting case is tautological compounds. So in tautological compounds there is a repetition. There is a there are two elements referring to the same thing. There are two synonymous words put together. So why these things have come into existence is because of language change. As you know, language goes on evolving, certain elements lose their you know, clarity of meaning in the contemporary language. Therefore, people uh, place another more uh, well-known form, meaning the same idea to support such words. Now, if you take words like Vili and Java, Vili and Lajjava mean the same. Anurupa Kuna, they mean the same. But the difference is Vili is a more archaic form and Lajjava is a more contemporary or a modern form. So, this is there are in uh, instances where uh, lesser known words or, or words of foreign origin are taken into the language, accompanied into the language. People uh, put a well known word from the native language to uh, pair them up 
and make them more understandable. Now, for example, you take a word like both lal, both and lal essentially mean the same thing, but both is a word of foreign origin, therefore, people have combined it lal to clarify the name. So, these are the findings of my research, and uh, I don't essentially need to read out the conclusion because I have run out of time already. So, I believe this is a very comprehensive classification of compound nouns in Sinhala language and it, I have attempted to include all different types of compounds that have come across but that doesn't mean that this is flawless. There can be functions in this classification so I would like to know your comments about this classification model which I propose, which I have proposed and I believe uh, that this framework can be utilized for teaching compounds in classroom as well as for computational linguistic work where you need to give, feed the computer a more realistic depiction of the compounds in single language. So these are my reference and with that I would like to wind up. So if you have any questions please feel free to ask. I will be joining virtually so I will be able to answer them. Thank you very much. Shall garden as near at the end. Mamma, they now serve for the law as near the hand. Come at it. A single summons for the Ganaka Gradi, Samakari, a single bash are they? Okadaki mother, Lakan a bash are it in the Samasa, Bashin it in the Samasa, Tatra, FTC, Vinasa. Netavarki, I mean, the Sialama, the Katheti, the Arkan Varki, the Ima, on the Kilitan. I'm going to 
Sarkar, Tavat, Patrika, Hatrakil, and the Tina, Kanus Kandu, the Tamar Pestuti, 